in this last of five seminars, we're going to be talking about personalized genomics. The learning objectives for today are, one, to describe and interpret single nucleotide polymorphisms, otherwise known as SNPs or SNPs, and this, how this variation works in humans. Two, to explain the possible roles of private SNP variants. Three, to describe what consumer genomics is and how it is being used. And four, to describe some applications of personalized genomic screening. Before we do that, though, perhaps we can start with the story. So this is the Golden State Killer case. This was a series of murders undertaken in California, right across the state, from the late 70s to the early 80s. And it wasn't solved at that time. But in 2018, the killer was identified by Barbara Ray Venter. What our question today is, why did it take so long? And how was the killer found? So today we're going to look at what is personalized genomics? What can it be used for? And increasingly, what is it used for? And what are the possible benefits and the possible disadvantages? Although it's hard to imagine now, the human genome has really been around for a very long time. So the first genome sequence, uh, so the, the first picture of the entire DNA of a living individual took about 13 years to develop. It cost over 5 billion US dollars in today's money, and it took the work of thousands of scientists from many, many different countries. And that was published in 2001. So for the younger members of, of this particular audience, you have probably always lived in a genomic world. And the prices for genome sequencing are falling. So one human genome around about the year 2001 cost about $5 billion. By 2009, you could do it for about $200,000. And as of you know 2019, you could do it for about $1,000. And prices are predicted to fall very, very fast, uh, certainly to be below $100 within the near future. And it's important to emphasize just how quickly those prices have fallen. So if you compare it to other things that we do, if you had bought um, a laptop and it had become you know, equivalently cheap, then a laptop that cost $1,000 back in 2001 would now cost $5. Uh, you know, a meal out that cost $100 would now cost $0.50. Cents. A home that cost $270,000 would be a little over $1,000. Clearly, none of these things have happened. The cost of most things have remained more or less the same, but the cost of the human genome has fallen very, very fast. And this has allowed us to do some very interesting things. So originally, we had to rely on what we thought of as population data. So we had to draw conclusions from large numbers of people and, and samples from, from different parts of the world. So essentially, what we were doing was we were averaging genetic information across people. If people in your part of the world had a certain genetic makeup, then probably you did too, and we drew conclusions from that. But increasingly, we can do genetic sampling on you and get a genome sequence, and we can draw conclusions directly about you. Now, this has led to a whole lot of really dodgy genomics. So if you go online, you can find all sorts of genomic tests for absolutely everything. This is one of my favorites, the DNA soccer test. Soccer genomics, unlock the player within you. And there are many similar tests online. Most of them are complete gimmicks, and they don't really have any basis in solid genetic evidence. But all of these tests, including the, the very good ones and the, and the medically relevant ones are based on these things called single nucleotide polymorphisms, otherwise called SNPs or often SNPs. A SNP is a change of one base and it's the most common form of variation in the genome. So here on the left you've got an example. So here's a stretch of DNA, a normal allele, where at the top you've got an A, and in the disease-associated layer at the bottom, you've got, say, a C. And this variation is measured at the scale of the genome. So there are hundreds of thousands of SNPs along the genome. We each share some SNPs with other people. 
But some of these SNPs are also unique to us. They are effectively private variants. In terms of common SNPs, many SNPs are, are found across really big geographical areas, but a large number of SNPs are also region specific. So here we've got a, a genetic picture of variation in Europe. This is something that is called a principal components plot. And you don't have to know very much detail, but basically we're plotting variation on, on two principal components. So principal component one is the up and down, principal component two on the horizontal. Each person is a point on this particular graph. And points that are closer together are more genetically similar. So there's not particularly any surprising here. So basically points that are close together are just genetically similar individuals. But what's really exciting is if you do this. What we've just done is we've overland a map of Europe over the genetic points. And it's a very, very close association. So what we're seeing here is a cluster at the bottom of Italians. On the cluster on the left is the Spanish and the Portuguese. Up the north you've got the Irish and the British. And to the, to the east you've got Eastern Europeans. What this is effectively telling us is that genetic variation, or at least certain parts of it, uh, are very specific to different parts of Europe to the extent that the genetic relationships between individuals that can be plotted on XY coordinates actually can be overlain on a map of Europe and essentially uh, recapitulate the geographical map. But there are certainly gaps in the regions that have been sampled. And this has been known for a while now. There's been a number of papers such as this one, genomics is failing on diversity. So if you look at most human genetic variation that is available today, including functional SNPs, it's restricted to certain regions. Over 80% of genomes come from Europeans in Europe, but also in places like uh, the United States and Australia. Of the other 20%, most are Chinese, Japanese, or Korean. So the vast majority of global human diversity is not being studied, and that in turn means that the information that we gain from these genomes in terms of medical outcomes are also benefiting European populations to the detriment of other regional groups. And of course, all of us carry private variants, so SNPs that are effectively unique to us. Some of these are somatic, they, they happen in our bodies, so they won't be passed on to our children. And so we're looking at that here with this particular picture. So on the left, we've got a colony of bacteria that has been dividing. A mutation occurs in some individuals, causing a color change from green to red, and then it expands out from their descendant populations. That's in bacteria. On the right, we've got the same thing happening, in this case using transposable elements, but mutations that occur in a petunia flower. So these stripes of color are collections of cells that have had particular mutations in them. These particular mutations are not passed on to the next generation because they won't end up in the seeds of this particular plant. Some of our mutations, though, occur in our germlines, in, in the cells that lead to egg cells and to sperm cells. And so you have about 60 new SNPs relative to the, your parents. So effectively, we are all mutants. And it's important to consider that these changes can vary from functional to neutral. So a neutral change is one that has absolutely no effect on us. So it's in a part of the DNA that does not affect how we look or our behavior or anything else. It could be used to track history, but it has no functional effect. And the vast majority of SNPs in the human genome are neutral. They have no functional effect on us. Functional changes, ones that change our phenotype, how we act, how we look, how we behave, they are relatively rare. And some of them we've already seen in pre previous uh, presentations. So some SNPs can have very obvious functions. Uh, they can be the causative agents of things like sickle cell anemia, which is the example shown here, Huntington's disease, chondrodysplasia, eye color, PTC tasting. So here's Here's a first of our class discussions to see if you've got that idea in your heads. Here what we're looking at is position 43 in the human growth hormone HGH gene. 
which changes from a leucine protein, uh, leucine amino acid, to a different shaped amino acid called proline. Now, the question is, what effect does this change have? A, no effect because leucine and proline are broadly similar. B, a modified function because leucine and proline have different shapes. C, the amino acid change is not informative about function. Or D, the protein is non-functional. What do you think the answer is? Stop the video for a moment, look at those questions and answers and see which one you think is correct. In this case, the correct answer is C. The amino acid change is not informative about function. In short, you cannot look at a particular change like this, like a leucine to a proline change, and say that has definitely caused a new function. Let's go through the other answers. No effect because leucine and proline are broadly similar. Well, that turns out not to be true. Leucine and proline actually have got quite different shapes and therefore can cause proteins to fold quite differently. But even if they were quite similar, you still couldn't infer from that that this change had led to a functional difference. So B is a modified function because leucine and proline have different shapes. As we've just said, just because they have different shapes or same shapes, that doesn't actually tell you anything about a function. D, the protein is non-functional. Again, you just can't know from the sequence alone. Here's another question. You're a doctor consulting with two patients who are worried about heart disease. Bob has got 30 mutations that are weakly predictive of heart disease. Sally has got eight mutations. Again, they're just, they're weakly predictive of heart disease. So you're the doctor, what should you tell your patients? Your options are A, Bob is likely to get heart disease, but not Sally. B, Sally is likely to get heart disease, but not Bob. C, both will get heart disease. Or D, neither may get heart disease. What do you think the answer is? Stop the video for a moment, look through those answers, and then see if you can choose the right one. The answer in this case is D, neither may get heart disease. So it is true that Bob has got more of these mutations than Sally. So Bob's got 30, Sally's only got eight. But the key point here is that these mutations are weakly predictive of heart disease. It means that if you've got a large number of them, yes, they may cumulatively add up and give you a slightly higher odds of hand and heart disease, but they're not sort of the smoking gun. So it's certainly true that because they're weakly predictive, probably neither Bob nor Sally will get heart disease. There's certainly no indication here that both will get heart disease. And I suppose if you wanted to consider it, Sally is less likely to get heart disease than Bob, but only slightly. The best answer here is neither may get heart disease. A key trend in recent years is this idea of consumer genomics. So this is where companies have taken uh, genetic testing and brought it out to individual people. So in the past, this hasn't really been possible. If you wanted to do genetic testing, you either had to be a geneticist yourself, or far more likely, you went to a medical doctor who might, on certain very rare occasions, uh, call for a genetic test to be done uh, on a sample from you. But consumer genomics, the ability to get genetic information from a company is now routine. These kind of tests are often given out as birthday gifts. And millions of people have been tested. It's now reached the point where the databases that are held in these uh, companies are probably the largest genomic databases anywhere in the world. And they're useful for telling you about all sorts of things. So they can tell you, for instance, about your deep ancestry, which is what we're looking at on the left here. So this particular person is told that 47% of their ancestry comes from Northwest Europeans, but they also have Chinese ancestry and Southeast Asian ancestry. Um, this can be useful if you just don't know much about your family history. The genetic tests are also useful for recent genealogy. So by looking at matches with other people in the databases, they can find family uh, relatives that maybe you didn't know about. So this is a particular example where uh, a particular individual has got half of their DNA from their father, and then 19% of that comes from their paternal grandfather and 37% comes from their 
paternal grandmother. And it's important to note that those numbers differ slightly. So you would expect there to be 50% from the father, that's fine, but 25% from each of the two grandparents. In this case, there's a bit of wiggle room there, uh, just through the vagaries of how genes are transmitted from one generation to the next. And you can see this in brothers and sisters too. So here we're seeing the genetic test for a real pair of siblings, uh, a couple that I happen to know. Siblings, on average, share half of their DNA. But when you look at this map on the left, this genetic map, you can see that some parts of the genome are not shared at all. Those are the bits in white. Some parts, they're identical for both of their copies. Those are shown in very dark colored blue. And some of them, only one of their alleles is shared, and that's shown in the, in the sort of half identical light blue color. So bits of your genome can either be half identical, completely identical, or not identical at all. So here's another class discussion. Imagine you've got a brother and sister who don't get along. So they take a genetic test to find out if they're really siblings. They test four genes, so not the whole genome, just four genes. Two genes are identical, two genes differ by a single SNP, and they're shown here in this picture on the right, with the SNPs shown by the star. Now, what can they really know from this? A, half their genes are shared, so they're siblings. B, the sister claims her brother is a mutant, so they're not siblings. C, not every gene is the same, so they cannot be siblings. Or D, some genes are shared, some not, so they may or may not be siblings. Stop the video, have a think about what your answer is, and then restart to see if it's the correct one. In this case, the answer is D. Some genes are shared, some are not, so they may or may not be siblings. So why are the other answers wrong? Well, A, half the genes are shared, so they have to be siblings. Well, people share genes who are not even related, so that isn't the correct answer. B, the sister claims her brother is a mutant, so they're not siblings. Well, her, her brother may be a mutant, but nonetheless, they could still be siblings. Just because their genetic changes doesn't mean they're not. And C, not every gene is the same, so they cannot be siblings. We've seen in the last example that even siblings have bits of the genome that they do not share in common. So you can still be siblings even though you don't share uh, all parts of your genome. This information about SNPs and variants and functional nuclear change and change in different regions is increasingly being used for health information. So the genetic basis of some phenotypes is very well known. So a very key example of this is lactase persistence. So most Western Europeans, for instance, have the ability to drink milk as adults without having sort of lactose intolerance. And G frequencies are highest for this in Europe, although they also occur in other parts of the world. And this kind of pattern holds true for pharmacogenomics too. So people respond differently to different drugs. So here, if you would consider an anti-leukemia drug, so 6 bacaptopurine. There are different people who have a change in the thiopurine methyltransferase gene. The mutant enzyme cannot process the drug, and that means that high doses can be fatal. And so if you look at the picture on the left, you can see that most people have the normal uh, variant of this particular gene. They have the proper enzyme, so you can give quite a lot of the drug, this anti-leukemia drug, and it's okay. They can process it, it will kill off the leukemia, and it won't hurt them. But there are some people who have a mutant version of this, just one of their copies. That's in the middle there in the green. And they have to have a slightly lower dose of this, uh, this anti-leukemia drug, which will still treat the cancer, but it has to be a low dose so it doesn't hurt them. And there's a few people who have a mutant on both of their copies. So they only have the mutant um, TPMT protein enzyme. And for them, they can only have a very, very small amount of the drug, which is still effective against the leukemia, uh, but it means that you have to give them a small amount of drug in order for them not to have very, very bad um, side effects.
when we look at consumer genomics, which can give you this sort of information, a large concern and criticism is the lack of medical support. This is a real big concern with consumer genomics, and there's no medical support, there's no medical guidance. People are essentially on their own. And so the FDA, again, this organization in the United States that controls drugs and drug testing in medical facilities, has had a bit of a crackdown on some of these companies and the ability to provide medical information from genetic testing. It's perhaps worth thinking at this point a little bit about anonymity and privacy. So most people would consider privacy to be a fairly fundamental right. Most genetic data is anonymized. So in other words, in databases, especially medical ones and research ones, names and other identifying information is removed from the databases. You've got the genetic information, but you don't have any names associated with it. But it's worth asking to what extent is privacy really possible? So here's a class discussion. Imagine that you have never taken a genetic test. You haven't done one of these consumer genomics um, at the test through the companies. Uh, but you don't know whether anyone in your family has. Maybe someone has, maybe they haven't. Do you think your genetic information is A, completely private, B, partially private, C, more accessible than private, or D, largely accessible? Have a bit of a think about this, and then stop the video while you're thinking, and then come back on and we'll see what the answer is. In this case, there is no answer. But if I had to take a guess, I would say that the true answer is much more close to largely accessible than completely private. And the reason is this. Genetic anonymity is effectively disappearing. So, so many people have taken these consumer genomics tests that it now is the case that around 60% of US citizens, at least those of European descent, could be identified using only a DNA sample, even if their DNA is not present in any database. The reason for this is that we share about 12.5% of our genome with our cousins, which means that even quite distant family members can indicate a link uh, to us. So it's been calculated now that around about 90% of US citizens could be identified to at least the cousin level. Um, just by using data that exists in databases, even if you in particular have not had a genetic test done. Which takes us back to the original question. Catching a killer. How did Barbara Ray Venter identify the Golden State Killer? The Golden State Killer was essentially identified from genetic evidence but perhaps not in the way that you would initially expect. So genomic SNPs were identified from crime scene evidence. Uh, the, the killer left behind various bits of evidence and DNA was taken from them. But they never had any matches to any of the police databases. So instead, in about 2018, those genomic SNPs were uploaded to genomic databases on the internet, that the kinds of databases that have been used for this consumer genomic testing. From that, close relatives were found. Then people worked out the family tree of those particular relatives using online information. And then they considered, uh, they narrowed it down to one likely person by considering other information, like where those people had been. Were they in the country at the time the crimes were committed? Did they live in the right part of the country? What sort of careers did they have? And so then in this particular case, they narrowed it down to one person who was the most likely candidate for the Golden State Killer. To confirm that he was the killer, DNA sample was taken from his garbage collection. So he put it out on the street, it was no longer his, and a DNA sample was taken from it. The crime scene DNA was now compared to the DNA from that garbage, and it matched. The suspect was arrested, but he was arrested nearly 30 years after his very last crime. So it took 30 years to catch him, and it took this uh, this sort of genomic revolution in order for that to occur. So what's the summary about personalized genomics? Well, increasingly, our genetic information is usable. We, 
We know what variants mean, at least to a certain extent, although it's quite hard to figure out for many complex cases. But it is important to realize that our genetic information is not really private anymore. So personalized genomics offers both advantages and disadvantages. Clearly, there are advantages in terms of uh, medical advances and the ability to use genetic information to tell you whether you should be taking certain drugs or having certain treatments. But there's disadvantages in terms of anonymity and the lack of privacy. These are choices about how we use genomic information, and they're going to become increasingly important and increasingly routine as time goes on. So these are going to be the kinds of questions that you're going to have to consider uh, at many points in your lifetime. So what do you do now? For those of you who are, who are listening to this as part of a university course, what you should be doing now is going back over your notes and focusing on those main concepts. Don't just read actively learn. Try to make sure that you don't get bogged down in the details, but you know the key points of each one of these slides. It would probably be wise to revisit the class discussion questions and their answers. Do you really understand why some answers are correct and the other answers are wrong? And then you should also get together with your friends and perhaps test each other. We're in the middle of the coronavirus period while I'm recording this, so perhaps do that online. For those of you who are not listening to this as part of the university course. I hope you've enjoyed the, the five seminars that have made up this series on genetic testing and genetic technologies. If you're interested about this, there's a whole lot of information on the internet, and hopefully there'll be more seminars to come. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed it.